that didn't come out of you. It came out of somebody else. Somebody else said, this year you should be wearing powder pink shirts with matching powder pink buck shoes. And I said, why? That, that's not who I am. That's who somebody else is. They wanted you to be somebody who would buy their stuff. This whole feeling of being somebody else's tool. Uh, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be somebody else's man. I want to be me. This campus is very good. In the mid-60s, a protest movement began on America's campuses. One of the students' main targets was corporate America. They accused the corporations of brainwashing the American public. Consumerism was not just a way of making money, it had become the means of keeping the masses docile, while allowing the government to pursue a violent and illegal war in Vietnam. The student's mentor was a famous radical philosopher called Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse had studied psychoanalysis and was a fierce critic of the Freudians. They had, he said, helped to create a world in which people were reduced to expressing their feelings and identities through mass-produced objects. It resulted in what he called one-dimensional man, conformist and repressed. The psychoanalysts had become the corrupt agents of those who ruled America. It was uh, one of the most striking phenomena to see to what extent the ruling uh, power structure, structure could manipulate, manage and control not only the consciousness, but also the subconscious and unconscious of the uh, individuals. And this uh, took place on a psychological basis by the controls and the manipulation of the unconscious primary drives which Freud stipulated. Think about it, dear American people out there. You hear them? They're all brainwashed, kiddies. They're all brainwashed. That's why you're here. They're saying right now, kill the bum. Look, I look at you in the living room. You know, you're saying, kill me. <laughs> Following the logic of Marcuse's argument, the new student left set out to attack this system of social control. It was summed up in the slogan, There is a policeman inside all our heads, he must be destroyed. And that policeman was going to be destroyed by overthrowing the state and the corporations that had put him there. One group, the Weathermen, began a series of bomb attacks on companies that they said both controlled people's minds through consumer products and made the weapons being used in Vietnam. There's no way to be committed to nonviolence in the middle of the most violent society that history's ever created. I'm not committed to nonviolence in any way. We want to live a life that isn't based on materialistic values, and yet the whole system of government and the economy of America is based on profit, on personal greed and selfishness, so that in order to be human, in order to love each other and be equal with each other and not place each other in roles, we have to destroy the kind of government that keeps us from asserting our positive values of life. But the American state fought back violently. At the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968, the police and the National Guard were unleashed to attack thousands of demonstrators. It was the start of a phase of ruthless repression of the new left in America. It culminated in the killing of four students at Kent State University 18 months later. In the face of this, the left began to fall apart. We had met the force of the state. It was much bigger and stronger and more powerful than we realized. And at that point, what seemed to happen was that there was a, a change in tactics. Confronted by this violent repression, many in the new left began to turn to a new idea. If it was impossible to get the policeman out of one's head by overthrowing the state, instead one should find a way of getting inside one's own mind and removing the controls implanted there by the state and the corporations. Out of this would come a new self and thus a new society. People who had been politically active were persuaded that if they could change themselves and be healthy individuals, and if a movement grew up just aimed at people changing themselves, 
then at some point all that positive change going on, well, you could say quantity would become quality and there would be a sort of a spontaneous transformation of society. But, politi but political activism was not required. It's about making a new you, that if enough people changed the way they were, that the society would change. So the personal became political? Yes, the personal became political. But without changing the personal, you didn't stand a chance of changing the political. Coming up against the state power of the United States was not an option. I mean, they outgunned us. <laughs> and to produce the new self, they turned to the ideas and techniques of Wilhelm Reich. Since his death, a small group of psychotherapists have been developing techniques based on Reich's ideas. Their aim was to invent ways that would allow individuals to free themselves from the controls implanted in their minds by society. Their center was a tiny old motel on the remote coast of California. It was called the Esalen Institute. The dominant figure at Esalen was a psychoanalyst called Fritz Perls. Perls had been trained by Reich and had developed a form of group encounter in which he pushed individuals to publicly express the feelings inside them that society had said were dangerous and should be repressed. It's a basic fear of that thing inside me, like a little demon in there. It doesn't come out very often. It's really hard to get it out. Now put the thing inside you on that chair and talk to it. Pearls used to call this getting on the hot seat in front of a group. This, if this were the hot seat and you were Pearls, and you would uh, guide me into this process of uh, self-enactment, self-revelation, um, of staying present to all the parts of yourself and noticing it, and then taking ownership of this. As the demon? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I can come out. I can come right out of him, and I can push him aside. So and you, see you. Push, I can push, push you, you aside. Yeah, yeah. Be the demon with each one of us. I can make you all cry. I can make you all feel terrible. Maybe even forever. I can make the mouth, this mouth here, do things and say things. I can almost destroy anyone, each one of you, if I get out. There isn't one of you that I would spare. Not even you. Yeah. How do you feel now? I feel better. I, I mean, I... I feel very honest. Yeah. And you notice the increase of power. It's In other words, taking ownership of who you are and how you act and how you feel. Your whole being in the world. In other words, giving you autonomy. Owning your freedom. I'm frightening. When I have my power, I'm frightening. See, I frighten you with my power. I frighten you with my power. Now, where do you feel the power? In your hands? In your muscles? Where else? My God! I want you to do for me! You. Okay, okay, okay. Stop it. F you. It was not phony movement. That's what I wanted to do, and I did it. What Pearls and others working at Esalen believed was that they were creating ways that allowed individuals to express their true inner selves. I want them to applaud for me. Oh. Out of this, they believed, would come new autonomous beings free of social conditioning. To the left, defeated in the wake of Chicago, it was an enormously attractive idea. These techniques could be used to unleash a new, powerful self, strong enough to overthrow the old order.
In the late 60s and early 70s, thousands flocked to Esalen. Only a few years before, it had been an obscure fringe institute, 